Whoever came up with the idea for the Rapid Dragon missile system is mentally ill in the best way possible. It's a pallet of cruise missiles hurled out the back of a C-130 cargo plane that then launch up to nine separate AGM-158 missiles at once, each able to hit a different target up to 1,200 miles away, or completely atomize a single point if you skip the lesson on preventing target overkill. How was it developed? What tactical situation would it be best used in? And what are some of the challenges that this system faces? And why does this idea make me want to hua all over the place? The idea of weaponizing seemingly innocent old cargo planes has been around since the Vietnam War, when C-130s were used to yeet giant 15,000 pound Blue 82 bombs right out the back. These were used to flatten a section of forest to make it safe for a helicopter to land. The problem was, you had to get close as heck to the enemy to drop it, so a lot of them were shot down in the process. Now, to fix that problem, in the 1980s, when it looked like the B-1 bomber might get cancelled, they came up with the cruise missile carrier aircraft, which was basically a 747 that you would fly to visit your family in, except they reconfigured it, modified it, to fire 50 to 100 AGM-86 3,000 pound cruise missiles. The aircraft was faster and flew higher, so it was safer from enemy fire. Similar to the Rapid Dragon missiles, they were released from the back of the aircraft, from a rotary launcher that ejected them right out the tail. The idea was never executed though because everyone had sobered up by the 1990s. Then, in 1996, the National Air Intelligence Center created a program called Altair, which demonstrated for the first time an air-launched drag chute-based missile system could work from a cargo plane. But I think this is where they missed a huge opportunity for a 1988 Con Air sequel about prisoners being transported with a missile in a cargo plane called Altair Con Air back in the cage. It'd be another decade in the year 2003 before the concept would be revisited by none other than insane graduate students in their 101 preliminary concept studies at the Air Force Institute of Technology. This is what happens when you give Air Force students too much free time and safe spaces. They dream up apocalyptic weapons. Before we get into that, I want to talk about this video sponsor, MyHeritage the leading global service for family history research and DNA testing. They have over 20 billion historical records and documents, and they can find documents for your relatives automatically. Using advanced AI technology, MyHeritage allows you to repair, colorize, and even animate historical photos. And with tools like instant discoveries and record matches, you can easily find ancestors' historical records and add an entire branch of relatives to your family tree in one click of a button. Let me show you how easy it is to build your family tree. Here, I can add a family member. And when you zoom out, you can see us going back in time to see great grandparents and their relatives going back generations. So if you're intrigued to learn more about your own family, sign up for a 14 day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features MyHeritage has to offer using the link below or scanning the QR code. One student, Ari Gerler, who was studying here from the Turkish Air Force, wrote his 100-page thesis paper on the idea. I went ahead and pulled it up. He imagined weaponizing cargo planes, but this time with a pallet box crammed full of cruise missiles. Unlike the 1980s concept, you wouldn't have to do a ton of remodifications that are expensive, costly, and require training. I've put a link in the description if you want to read it. But the thrust of his argument is that since the 1980s, cruise missiles have become more commonplace with greater long-range capabilities. During the first few days of a hypothetical war, the Air Force has a major problem to contend with. They have far more targets that they need to destroy than they have fighters and bombers, which requires a lot of separate sorties. But if each cargo plane could drop 45 missiles in five separate pallet boxes from a safe distance, that greatly increases the speed at which an air campaign can be completed. That might make war sound like a numbers game, but in this case it kind of is. However, the idea was quickly forgotten about yet again, because remember, this was back in 2003, and everyone was like, I don't think we need to fire 45 cruise missiles that cost $1.5 million each at a guy with an AK-47. Or do we? No, no, we don't. Fast forward yet another decade, and the idea got dusted off and picked up off the shelf once again in 2015, once the military realized near-peer warfare might be back on the menu. In 2015, this RAND publication resurrected the unholy idea when they advocated improving standoff bombing in a cheap way by using cargo planes yet again. But still, the program had not yet been officially picked up by the United States Air Force, 
as a weapons program to finally turn from a fever dream into a reality. Airdrops of supplies have been commonplace since World War II, but where the Rapid Dragon system takes a hard left turn is that its parachute is rigged in such a way so that the missile cargo in the pallet box is oriented nose down. The way it works is that when each missile is released in sequence, it falls out of a barrel-like chamber or cell. As it does this, the wings unfold along with its tail. Then the engine on the missile is ignited, which generates thrust, so it can maneuver to the designated target. The AGM-158 JASM extended range that it drops is a huge, stealthy, long-range missile that weighs about 2,200 pounds total, with a 1,000 pound armor-piercing warhead on it, and those guys working in logistics thought they weren't gonna have to stack bodies like the rest of us. The way I like to explain the Rapid Dragon missile system is that, you know how a burrito is the delivery vehicle for the cheese, meat, beans, right? In this case, the Rapid Dragon is the burrito for the missiles. It took yet another four whole years before the Air Force would pick up the concept for development. In 2019, they officially began work on the Rapid Dragon program. Why'd they name it that? The name comes from an over 1,000 year old siege weapon from China called the Jilongqi or the Rapid Dragon Cart. These were basically a combination of giant crossbows and catapults, which after being fired would launch a dozen giant crossbolts into enemy defenses, saturating them with fire. A quote from the Air Force Research Laboratory on the naming convention states, quote, Today, the Rapid Dragon concept is changing the game again, this time as an airborne delivery system for US Air Force weapons. And like its namesake, these palletized munitions promise to unleash mighty salvos and mass on distant adversaries. It'd be kind of like if China called their new gun the Browning QBZ-191. Rapid Dragon came out of the Air Force's Strategic Development Planning and Experimentation Office. They're like the Mythbusters, but for the Air Force, they go out and experiment on crazy ideas to see if they actually work. The reason they were excited about this specific idea in 2019 is because it's when the US military got concerned with being outnumbered in the Pacific. Currently, there are 300 C-130s being flown by the United States. That number is soon to be reduced to 255. These are the classic four-engine prop planes that have been in service since 1956. They carry two pallets that contain six missiles each. I flew in one of these to Puerto Rico for a training mission, and it is a rough, slow ride. There are 222 of the C-17 Globemaster 3s, which are a bigger, more capable jet-powered brother that's been in service since 1993. They can carry a total of five pallet boxes, each with nine missiles, giving you a total of 45 individual AGM-158s. Still not anywhere close to what you can carry in Ace Combat, but it's a start. And there are 94 of the incomprehensibly large C-5 Galaxy planes. These numbers add up to a total 731 potential bombers. There are important considerations here though. Ari's paper from 2003 pointed to a problem that still exists today. America's cargo planes are already heavily taxed. Adding a new mission on top of the already existing one would be difficult. Imagine if you were doing a job and your boss came up and said, hey Carl, I noticed you're doing a stellar job. How about you do this new job on top of that? Also, is it cool if I come by on Tuesday and f*** your wife? General Ovos, commander of the U.S. Transportation Command, said to the Senate Armed Services Committee in 2023, The Air Force's largest airlift fleet, the C-130 Force, has lost almost 50% of its capacity, from a high of well over 500 aircraft in Operation Desert Storm to the current program levels. So the C-130 were the planes most likely to fulfill the Rapid Dragon mission in the first place. However, other reports like the 2016 Mobility Capability Study found that the Air Force can carry 35.9 million ton miles per day, and they estimated even in surge capacity, they would only need 32 million tons per day. There's no doubt the United States Air Force has incredible airlift, but this is still an important factor to consider with this strategy. You have to decide whether or not you want to sacrifice transportation space for missiles during the opening of a war a critical period of time when you need to move troops and equipment at peak rate. If you ask me personally, I could go without an extra pallet of MREs if it meant more missiles dropped on the enemy, but don't ask me to choose between cheese tortellini and rapid dragon pallets. The tactical purpose would be to address the main US military concern, which is that their adversaries have invested heavily in A2AD systems, like your long range missiles that prevent them from closing with and destroying the enemy. The Rapid Dragon would overwhelm air defense nodes, 
with multiple attacks at once. The first and second missile might get intercepted, but the third and fourth have a pretty good chance of taking out that expensive air radar system. The United States and her allies have an unmatched air logistics network, with hundreds of airstrips and cargo aircrafts across the world. And so this concept plays to the United States and their allies' strengths. We also have to take into account that the B-52 and B-1 bomber require twice the runway as a cargo plane. Lieutenant General Jim Selfie, commander of the Air Force Special Operations Command, put it this way, it's not hard to figure out where a 10,000-foot concrete runway in the Pacific is located. But when you're trying to figure out where 3,000 feet stretches of road and grass strips are, that's a different targeting problem for your adversaries. If I put on my strategic thinking cap real quick, it lets any foreign military ally who already has commonplace cargo planes adapt to act as a weapon. This complicates the enemy's attempt to destroy your bombers because they can't write off a C-130 as a non-threat like they normally would. This forces them to expend more missiles. It might not look like it, but flying cargo is dangerous as heck. If any of the cargo or pallet or equipment in the back becomes unfixed during flight and moves around, it can and has caused planes to crash in the past. From Ari's Air Force thesis paper, the cargo has to stay fixed in flight because of the center of gravity considerations, except during airdrop. So dropping mixed cargo of missiles while transporting equipment is something that someone will have to do mission planning for. I'm picturing an O2 Air Force officer watching this, just dreading having to come up with mission plans for a Rapid Dragon over South China Sea in 2032. By 2021, the Rapid Dragon was ready to be test fired for the first time. They took off from an Air Force base in Florida and successfully test fired it in New Mexico, completely destroying a target with precision missiles. The standoff distance of over 1,000 miles allows the slow moving cargo plane to safely stay out of range of incoming fire. In 2022, the Rapid Dragon was then successfully test fired again, this time in the European theater. And the following year in July 2023, it was successfully test fired in the Pacific, just outside of Chinese held waters. Only a month later, Japan began the work of preparing their 13 C2 transport jets to accommodate the Rapid Dragon system as they continue their military modernization efforts. How it did the targeting is interesting. The fact that the JASM cruise missiles have such a massive range actually poses a problem guiding the round to the target. This is usually done with the aircraft itself on onboard sensors. This won't work with the Rapid Dragon though, firstly because the C-130s and C-17s lack that kind of hardware, and secondly, even if they did, the targets in question would be too far away for them to track themselves. There are a few ways to handle this. During testing, the targeting data was fed to the munition while the C-130 was in mid-flight. The data is sent to the Rapid Dragon pallet, which then acts as a node and feeds the information to the missiles themselves. The munitions primarily operate off of GPS and inertial navigation units. The INUs keep track of where it's traveled based off of the physical movement through space. You know that one meme, the missile knows where it is? The missile knows where it is at all times and arriving at a position where it wasn't, it now is. Yeah, it's like that, but in real life. It does this to counter any GPS jamming between it and the target. Once all targeting info is uploaded and the aircraft is in range, the Rapid Dragon's parachute system deploys, yanking the entire payload out the back. The pallet senses the entire package has stabilized in air and releases the missiles. After they're released, their engine systems ignite, and after getting a bit of airspeed, they level out and ascend to the crew's altitude, and then they proceed to do bad things to bad people. But this is when we need to address the potential challenges with this program. We've yet to see the system go into mass production yet. That doesn't mean that it couldn't be quickly fielded if it needed to be. It is possible indication, though, that there's more work to be done, or that the Air Force thinks that the missiles can be used to greater effect elsewhere. Have you ever reached for an extra JASM missile and found there were none left? That's the worst feeling. But it's also a challenge we need to consider. My understanding is that the US Air Force 2022 budget requested about $711 million for 525 of the JASM ER missiles. That would be the highest yearly production level possible. And I'm guessing that the priority for those are not gonna be for a large scale pallet weapon system just yet. The United States actually has a pretty massive stockpile of cruise missiles. They have a total of 7,500 JASM missiles produced so far, which means they could definitely spare a couple for this strategy 
if it was deemed feasible. I might not have gotten a high enough ASVAB score to get into the Air Force, but I do have the calculator app on my phone, and that thing is telling me that the C-17 fully loaded with cruise missiles would cost about $67.5 million. As staggering as that sounds, building the cheapest US bomber, the B-52, cost $94 million just to manufacture. According to a C-130J pilot that we spoke to about the program, with the increases in purchases of large quantities of JASIMAR missiles, especially to countries with smaller defense budgets, Lockheed Martin will need to negotiate pricing, which will then benefit from economies of scale and will only increase their proliferation. Both Finland and Poland have recently purchased hundreds of these missiles, and both operate cargo aircraft capable of accommodating the Rapid Dragon system. The ability for this system to shift the balance of power in the favor of the United States and its allies have caught the attention of both China and Russia. In fact, it's this proliferation that has some groups alarmed, like the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, who closely monitor and report on anything related to nuclear warfare. According to them, the Rapid Dragon is almost too easy a system to use, especially if it's upgraded or modified to carry something like the AGM-86B air-launched cruise missile, which can carry a 150 kiloton nuclear warhead. I have to say, it's not just Hollywood rebooting old ideas, because remember when I said earlier that the cruise missile carrier program from the 1980s was never followed through on? The day I went to publish this, I heard news of a Boeing announcement. They're now working on a new rotary missile launcher for the C-17 that would fire up to 12 hypersonic missiles from two separate drums. A resurrection and improvement of the old idea. But this one will have an advanced electromagnetic catapult launch system and software that can communicate with the missile to the target. As tensions rise in Europe and the Asia Pacific, talks of nuclear warfare have reared their head again. And it could just be a matter of time before the humble C-130 becomes a flying apocalypse carrier. For now though, the Rapid Dragon is still going through testing. It's currently in phase four, according to a recent Air Force publication that validates the ability for live munitions to effectively hit their target at range. As of 2022, it's been in the low production rates, but numbers of Rapid Dragon systems are only expected to go up. Hopefully the students at the US Army War College are already working on thesis papers on how to turn logistics trucks into missiles now. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. If you found anything in the video useful, please hit the like and subscribe button. Before you go, don't forget to sign up for a 14 day free trial using the link below or scanning the QR code. Join our Discord channel and I'll see you guys again soon. Signing off this net time now.